Welcome. My name is Kate McGrail, and I'm a member of the Community Health and Wellness Division at Suburban Hospital. We are pleased to have you here today for today's program, Maintaining Mental Health as You Age. Mental health is very important at every stage of life and includes emotional, psychological, and social well being. Today's topic, much like our last several sessions, is participant driven. Many of you have expressed to your local village leaders post pandemic concerns about re engaging and reconnecting. Perhaps you've also experienced life changes such as a medical illness, the loss of a loved one, or not, or are not adjusting to retired life the way you expected. These are just a few examples of circumstances that could lead to feelings of grief, loneliness, or disconnectedness that may also lead to depression or anxiety. If you feel like you've strayed off course in maintaining your mental health, we're here today to share understanding that you're not alone. Depression and anxiety are treatable medical conditions not a normal part of aging. Today, we're going to learn about why older adults are at increased risk of depression, how anxiety presents in older adults, how to recognize the signs and symptoms of anxiety and depression, and effective treatment options, strategies, and resources to manage mental health and improve quality of life. So we'll start with some housekeeping before I introduce our partners and our speakers. So we will be recording this session and we will share it with everyone who is registered. You may also access closed captioning by clicking on the CC icon once. You will find it at the bottom of your screen on most devices. In order to allow us to focus on the presenter, we ask you to remain on mute. We yeah. highly en encourage interaction with our speakers, so please feel free to use the Q&A feature, which is different than the chat or hand raise features. You may use that to type your questions at any time, and we'll take time, we'll reserve time at the end of our program to respond to your questions. Lastly, the programming we offer is highly driven on your feedback. We kindly ask that you take a moment at the end of the session to complete a very short evaluation. The form will pop up at the end when you hit the red leave button. And if you're unable to complete the survey today, we'll follow up with a link in the email that we'll send you with the recording. Did you know that the U.S. Census Bureau predicts that by the year 2035, the number of adults greater than 65 will outnumber children in our country? With the tremendous advancement in medicine, we are all living longer, but we also want to live better, of course. So in a moment, you'll hear more about the local villages partnering with this event, but at Suburban, we support initiatives aligned with the local village movement and that is our desire to keep older adults not just living, but thriving independently, empowered both physically and mentally. Seminars such as this one are one example of how we support these goals. And we are also proud to have invested over $15,000 over the last several years in empowering villages to make advancing advances in aging at the local level. But now we'll hear directly from one of our villages, Kathy Libby, is the board president of Little Falls Village, and she has a few words for us today. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Kathy Libby. I'm president of the uh, board for Little Falls Village, which is here in Bethesda. But on half of all behalf of all of the villages, I want to thank our speaker today, Dr. Carlos Brown, and also Kate McGrail of Suburban Hospitals Village Ambassador Alliance for arranging this program, which I can tell you we're all very interested in, I'm sure. Um, it's made possible this event through the cooperation of three area villages, Friendship Heights Neighbors Network in Chevy Chase, Greatest Stonegate Village in Silver Spring, <clears throat> and again, Little Falls Village in Bethesda. And we villages, there are a lot of um, um, Montgomery County 
Um, we what we do is we do similar services, but we do them in different geographic areas. So we're very um, cooperative and collaborative with each other, which is nice. Um, <clears throat> what we basically do is help older residents remain in their homes for as long as possible. We do that by supporting them with rides to the doctors, um, to the library, to the YMCA, wherever one needs to go, uh, helping with shopping or uh, a number of other things. We also uh, help people enjoy social connections. Sometimes we get very isolated. So there's lots of things that our groups co um, collaborate with, with um, you know lunches and various uh, groups around different books or uh, poetry or something. Um, and enriching programs like this one that we all need to pay attention to. So villages play an important role in mental health. And um, we bet by keeping our members supported, uh, by keeping us connected and engaged and active in our community. If you want to learn more, the you can go online to the WAVE Villages, that's W-A-V-E, all caps, and uh, read about more about villages, especially in this area. So thank you all for being here. And again, uh, Dr. Brown and Kate, thank you so much for helping us. Thank you, Kathy. And now I have the honor of introducing our featured speaker. Dr. Carlos Brown is a licensed independent clinical social worker and holds recognition in both Michigan and the District of Columbia. With a PhD in advanced clinical social work, he brings forth a wealth of experience spanning over a decade dedicated to collaborating with diverse populations and championing, championing systematic changes with the realms of healthcare, child welfare, and behavioral health. Presently, Dr. Brown assumes the role of behavioral health manager in the Department of Psychiatry at Sibley Memorial Hospital. Dr. Brown is also the owner and practitioner of a mental telehealth practice. His versatile career has involved engagement in various capacities, such as residential care settings, refugee services, foster care, behavioral case, health case management, and home-based intervention, senior services, program management, and diversity and inclusion work. Motivated by an unwavering passion for mental health and wellness, Dr. Brown actively endeavors to demystify stigma surrounding mental health and substance use disorders, advocating for symptom management, healthy living, and resiliency as essential pillars of wellness. He champions a holistic approach to treatment. Dr. Brown seamlessly collaborates with fellow professionals to ensure individuals under his care received optimal treatment and support on their journey to wellness. Thank you. And now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Brown. Ooh, let me unshare. That's right. Good afternoon, everyone, as we switch over screens here. Presentation up. Can I get just a thumbs up from Kate that my screen is shared? And all righty. All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining. Um, today we're going to be going through um identifying and understanding what mental health is, or specifically anxiety and depression, specific to older adults, um, signs, symptoms, areas of concern, any kind of conflicts how to navigate those as well as some resources that have already been mentioned, but also some additional uh, practices that you can incorporate proactively to maintain your mental health. Okay. Um, feel free to uh, post any questions in the Q&A area and we plan. I'll make sure that there's at least significant amount of time at the end of the talk to ensure that we can, we can address a good amount of those questions. Okay. Uh, and previously discussed in my bio, I want to provide a disclosure. I do work for Johns Hopkins City Memorial Hospital as well as own and practice at CMB Well LLC, which is based in Michigan as well as DC. Um, there is no conflict at this point in time, but I do want to you know, acknowledge that those are two entities that I do represent. Bio, which has already been disclosed and discussed, um, our outline for today. Um, we're going to 
explain anxiety and depression of what it looks like in older adults. I will also draw some comparisons of a presentation of anxiety and depression from young adults to older adults and those different components of why those symptoms may present the same but have a different loop or a different trigger. Um, the impact on daily life functions, um, available ports, supports and resources, how to seek help, and kind of just wrapping everything together, what it means, what can we do with it, and what are the next steps. And then we'll do our questions and resources. All right, so in a nutshell, I, I don't want to run you through a course of helping you identify and use the DSM-5 to uh, understand anxiety and depression, but I wanna just give you in a nutshell, anxiety is essentially the persistent and excessive worry, fear, apprehension about everyday activities. Um, and they are some unique situations where it can be specific to one or more uh, particular events. So it could be riding cars, going on buses, um, being in the public, uh, especially given the pandemic, a lot of people have developed you know, community-based uh, like agoraphobia, where they're worried about being in the community due to risk of being sick and exposure, things of that nature. So there are some new com components and nuances to anxiety um, that are more prevalent than they have been in the past. And on the flip, there is depression, which is the persistent feelings of sadness, hopelessness, and lost interest in pleasure in activities that you once enjoyed. So if you enjoyed gardening in the uh, last three weeks, you have no desire and passion to be outside. And it's this time of the year you would typically be enjoy enjoying your tulips or um, you know, gardening and doing some weeding and proactive planning for your garden and you're just you're not interested in doing that. That is uh, an example. All right, so prevalence. Anxiety, approximately seven to 15% of older adults age 65 and older um, can connect clinically had significant anxiety disorders uh, in a given year. And so what that means is it is a rotating door what these statistics look like. It's not just the standard, you know, these same people, it's a new onset. So this year could be 13, 14%, and that's a set of people, and then there's a new set of people in the bottom year. So it could mean more people are experiencing anxiety and depression, um, depending on various things happening in that year. And on the same, that is the same prevalence when it comes to depression. It's one in five percent of older adults um, each year. These are both based on the National Institute of Mental Health. Okay, so some contributing factors that are unique to older adults compared to younger adults are first and foremost health conditions. Right, as we age, we are living longer, but that doesn't mean that we don't have the same physical components. That um, our bodies are not doing the same thing that it did. 15, 20, 30 years ago. Um, functional limitations, it's limits on things that we are able to do physically, emotionally, right? Our memory may not be the same, or it's hard for us to, you know, to do more complex tasks, can be frustrating and lead to those, those components of anxiety and depression. Social isolation and loneliness, as, so, as we age, you know, our loved ones and connections that we've had for years, sometimes they change because of their capacity or their health and wellness or you know the circle of life and they may not want to be with us and so those moments and changes affect how we navigate that um, as we age we're living longer financial stress right? retirement um, there's components when it comes to medical coverage things like that that cause the stressors and then at the end of the day i think stigma affects every demographic <laughs> um and then for older adults there are also barriers to care when it comes to treating older adults with psychiatric problems, as well as advances in technology when it comes to physical health conditions. So what you see here is a um, word cloud, and it's a way to kind of help us understand the, the frequency that these words occur during a study. And on the left side, you'll see um, sad, restless, tired, happy, good, content. These are presentations that younger adults symptom-wise explain what they felt in the changes of their mood based on the PHQ-9, which is a screener for depression. It's not in questions. And so oftentimes they related these words of you know, tense, of tight relationships as contributing factors to why they may be depressed. And if you look on the right side, the older adults, the, high, the bigger words are worried, money, 
or they felt normal and calm or anxious at the bottom or accomplished. So these are things that helped them or made them feel more depressed as they navigated the world around them. So just a good way to kind of see that there's same symptomology, but there's different roots and triggers to why a person may feel like. Same here for anxiety for older adults on the far right side, young adults on the left side. So you see here on the left side for younger adults, you see that it's more emotion-based, right? Content, happy, sad, quiet, and motivated, relationships, et cetera. On the right, it's a lot of physical, as well as a lot of financial external stressors, money, hunger, trained, right? Worried and anxious is a common word they're able to use. Finances, conflict, conflict, uh, confident and not fully productive. Those are some common words for older adults that are very different than what younger adults are experiencing. So common signs and symptoms when it comes to anxiety, right? There's the increased, there's the physical responses, right? There's an increased heart rate, it's highly in breathing, social withdrawal, panic attacks, feeling worried, fear of uh, dread, physical symptoms, irritability, restlessness, difficulty concentrating, avoided behaviors, changes in sleeping patterns. And what we'll do later is we'll also see where there is an interconnection between anxiety and depression of some of those symptoms. Depression, there's that persistent sadness. Again, you see here, sleep disturbance, fatigue, change of appetite. And that can be with or without weight loss um, or weight gain. Um, that can be an increase of, ap increase of appetite or excessive binge eating or the, the res restriction of difficulty concentrating, changes in our motor function, whether it's slowed or it's heightened. So you're feeling restless, you can sit down, you're moving really fast or rigid. Those are those changes that are, and these are all explained as not other medical. So it's not saying that someone with Parkinson's may not have some, some psychomotor components, right? Um, so the intersection of depression and anxiety. Um, the same triggers or baselines of what may cause anxiety and depression are comorbidity. So that could be you recently received a physical health diagnosis that is causing that, right? Or, you know, it's been 20, 30 years and you've been dealing with depression and anxiety since you were younger. Um, Dr. Brown, one, can, are you able to speak up just a little bit louder for some participants who are struggling to hear? Yes. And I'll also Thank you. I hear you fine, but um, just maybe a little louder. Thank you. Is this better? Can I get a thumbs up? Better? I see it. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. And so understanding that there's intersection between depression and anxiety, and that is those underlying mechanisms that could be physical health, those could be those triggering events. So it's the, the loss of a loved one, it could be changes in your physical uh, health and abilities, um, impacts on your functioning, and then also treatment. The intersection between anxiety and depression treatment-wise are common when it comes to medications that we'll be using, anti-anxiety medications, things of that nature, as well as a psychotherapy. So cognitive behavioral therapy is a common practice that is effective for addressing a wide area, wide range of mental health diagnosis, including anxiety and depression. So there's overlay when it comes to treatment, there's overlay when it comes to symptom presentation, there's overlay when it comes to the triggering events that may cause someone to feel anxious at the beginning and depressed at the end, or vice versa, or both at the same time. All right, so now breaking these symptoms down, we can put them into areas of how they affect our daily life. And with understanding how it affects our daily life, we can think about ways to be proactive, okay? So with daily functioning, there's the isolation, the sleep disturbance, um, individuals who are more anxious and depressed oftentimes are at higher risk for substance use. And that's simply because we as humans want to find ways of calming our nerves or calming our feelings and, you know, hey, I can try this or that and I know that helps or I hope that and I know that calms me, right? And productivity. If you're depressed or anxious, it's harder to feel like you want to get involved in social interactions or get involved in your daily activities that would include you know, socializing, you know, gardening, physical health. Um, the impact when it comes to mental health, there are the interconnectedness of, again, physical health and mental health go hand in hand, right? If you're taking care of your physical or, or your physical drops, your mental health also drops. And so there's a, that interconnected play of 
how to find balance and wellness, okay? Um, biological and mental health. There was a component when it comes to medication or physical changes that are going on in our bodies that may affect our mental health and physical health. Healthy behaviors or proactive lifestyles, right? Those can help with maintaining and affecting, effectively improving the way our symptoms that we're experiencing impact or don't impact our lives, okay? Um, there's connections and research that show that inflammation and metabolic syndrome disorders, like uh, like depression and anxiety, as well as like, those affect the way our gut health, right? The brain and gut connection. There's issues and connections with um, the uh, diabetes and anxiety, things of that nature. So those metabolic syndrome disorders have some connections when it comes to behavior to behavioral health. Um, the challenges with anxiety and depression for older adults, right? There's that social isolation we continue to talk about. Accessibility is difficult for older adults when it comes to, you know, some possible physical limitations. A lot of practitioners in the, 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 in the area are all switching to virtual, and that may not be a preferred method or uh, access point for a lot of individuals. Um, if you have physical health diagnoses and the medications you're taking, a lot of times there are drug interactions with physical health medications and psychotropic medications. Um, again, stigma. And then there's also the onsite with aging. There is that possible component of dementia. And so a lot of times as practitioners, we are working to properly develop healthy practices and lifestyles to minimize those, those risks but also understanding that if that is a part of that person's life and individual's experience, us navigating that together and how to implement the most appropriate services and resources to help navigate life and continue to be on that best path of thriving. All right, so proactive approaches to managing anxiety and depression or proactively um, minimizing the risk for it, right? And I, I put regular health checkups as a last bullet point, but I also would love that to be at the top, right? And that's because as with aging, it's important that we are following up with our providers, our specialists, um, and following those regimens as much as possible. And if there's any changes that you're collaborating with those providers, with those resources, and letting them know, hey, I've been on this regimen for a while, and this is what I'm experiencing. And it's very important that you're connecting those pieces with the physical health and the emotional health together and expressing those changes and experiences so that way individuals can better serve and support. Um, managing stress, there's multiple uh, methods of managing stress, right? That's before we even started this call, we as a group took a nice deep breath and then a nice sigh out, right? That's helping us with bringing down heart rates and, and managing our overall feelings of, of calmness, okay? Staying informed. Attending se uh, seminars like this, doing research and exploring, it helps with navigating symptoms and, and how to manage your life. A healthy diet that is based on, again, following the direction of your specialist um, can help with managing, proactively managing stress and anxiety. Um, engaging in cognitive activities. It may sound taboo or cliche, but um, the mind, bra the brain exercises, the writings, the the brain games are very effective in managing your overall well-being from a mental health standpoint. Staying socially connected. One of the best protective factors for anxiety and depression, as well as individuals with depression and suicidal ideation, is social connectedness. Research has shown that individuals who are socially connected are less likely to attempt suicide or have safe places to help them navigate mental health distress because they feel like they are valued and they, they belong. And if we tie that back to uh, Maslow hierarchy of need, right? One of those basic tenets is sense of belonging and connectedness. And so that is a, a principle and a practice that transitions throughout life. And I mean, I can't, be, can't remember how old that Maslow, that diagram was created, but that, I mean, that still stands present to today where we as humans need to feel connected. And the biggest piece for older adults as they're navigating life, it's, hard, it's harder to feel connected when individuals are all experiencing the same thing. They're, they're, you know, 
they're, they're not, they either they're dying or they're just overall withdrawing themselves because it's harder. And it's important to actually reach out and stay connected. So attending the village resources and, and programming, uh, going for walks or any type of modified movements and connections that you can make and this, you know, maybe using technology and phone calls and letters, those things help you stay connected to individuals that can help you feel supported and make a good life as you age. Getting sufficient sleep may sound minuscule, but it plays a huge role in our overall physical health and well-being, right? Getting sleep and rest helps our body relax and get to that place of finding homeostasis, which is that level of, of returning to baseline, right? Even on a natural day without anxiety, without depression, we as humans go through a roller coaster of emotions and experiences. And the difference between that and anxiety and depression is just staying in one area too long, right? Going too low from that baseline is depression, going way above that can be that anxiety. And so it's finding that way of continuing to roll with the tide or ride the roller coaster, however you want to use that and navigating life with those resources and how they can support you. All right, so some local resources, which have already been mentioned. Um, I think these are some, some great resources. Um, the local libraries all, often hold um, resources and classes that help individuals, older adults, navigate um, their environment and community. Some natural resources that, um, and those, I know this slide be, will be shared with you all, but, um, there are some great resources, uh, especially when it comes to mental health apps. Um, if you're able to use those, there's there's numbers that you can call as helplines um, of accessing specific resources for aging populations. Right. Um, this is the new 988, is the new crisis and suicide prevention line. So you can call and text that number at any point in time to be connected to a trained professional that can help you navigate any type of emotional stress you may be experiencing or a loved one, right? As the part of being connected and, and staying moved with the others around you is learning, learning how to navigate the resources together and checking in with each other and navigating that space with support. Right? All right. Questions or concerns? All right, so please start to place your questions in the Q&A feature. We've been using the chat so far, but um, the button next to it to the left will take your questions for Dr. Brown. Thank you, Dr. Brown. That was very informative. I appreciate it. So come on in with your questions. And what are some signs of actual okay. dementia rather than just normal forgetfulness. I think a lot of people probably have that on their mind. Yes. So the, the difference is, um, this is a, a little question you always say, do you, do you know that you're forgetting? And that is, that is normal traditional process of going through. Just my mind is just not remembering as much as it used to. Dementia is they don't know or they're not aware of the fact that they're forgetting or functioning differently. Whereas if you're going through and you're like, oh, I forgot my keys or I can't believe I left the coffee pot, right? That's that natural transition of forgetfulness. Whereas the mental, you're, you're not present or aware of what that what is being missed or forgotten. Okay, I'm going to read one from the chat box. Um, how can we get an older relative to treat their depression when their physician seems unaware of it and unaware of their dementia? That is a good question. Um, I think it, part of it is, where is that person at, right? It's that person's own autonomy to decide where they want to go in with treatment or how that what that looks like. And part of that is having a conversation with their physician, um, but also as a worst case scenario, if all else fails, come to the emergency room, express concern, and figure out how to get resources from there or um, depending on what community resources they're connected to, 
contacting behavioral health services and getting some support that way. They're all able to kind of help navigate that from that standpoint of ensuring safety and next step of resources. Thank you. Um, I'm actually curious about like, oh, here's another one. Is it safe to take a medicine like, I hope I'm pronouncing this, Busaprone? At my age of 74, it was recommended by my physician since I experienced anxiety mostly every night. I try to fight it, but it is hard and overwhelming. Thank you for sharing. Yes, thank you for sharing and thank you for your transparency. Um, safe is as a relative word, right? Everybody, you know, we could all sit down and say, everybody could take an Advil or a Tylenol, right? But everybody has a different reaction to even that or a multivitamin, right? And so part of it, what that means is working with your provider or asking a provider to help connect you to a specialist that can help with you with tracking and monitoring the response to those reactions, if in with that medication. So I'm, I'm a big advocate for communicating your concerns, asking questions, tracking, you know, hey, I took, I took Buspron at you know, last night and I, I slept really well. I took it last night and I couldn't go to sleep or I was itching, right? Those are things to document and, and share with your, your providers so that way they can help explore what's appropriate for you. And is there any scientific proof that dementia can be passed from generation to generation? There's some... There are some um, precursors and things like that that have explained, you know, with dementia and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, things like that. If there's family members, same with depression, anxiety, if the his family history of it, it is not a guarantee that you'll have it, but there, there is some correlation. Correlation does not mean causation. <laughs> when do you seek help? We all feel anxious and depressed at times. When are these feelings becoming a problem? Yes. So I always say from a pro proactive standpoint, it doesn't hurt to get a, a therapist. One, because it's so hard to find them nowadays, right? Um, finding a therapist and it doesn't hurt to just have one and just say, I want a therapist to help me navigate aging. Uh -huh. And then um, when should you get help? I always say that the example I use is when when your symptoms and what you're experiencing affect your ability to live, laugh, love, and learn or work, right? If there's some specific hobbies or things that you enjoy doing, and because of your mood, because of your worry, because of that, you can't do it anymore. You're not interacting with your friends. It's too much. You're isolated, right? Or you notice that, you know, I'm typically a bubbly person and I'm completely low all the time, right? We're talking about that base, right? Life is this, right? We're going away. But if I feel myself kind of being always up here, always down here, I think that's when you should explore doing that. All right. What can the villages do to support the mental health of their members? And how can we as individuals do more to help our neighbors and friends? I think the big piece with, with, with multiple populations of individuals and clusters is stigma, right? Stigma plays such a big role in why we do not access resources, why we are resistant to medications or treatments, <laughs> right? It's all the whys. <laughs> and what communities can do or what agents of change can do is advocate and normalize getting help, advocate and normalize checking in with each other, advocate and normalize, you know, I'm trying to think of, they have now these, these mental health check-in Mondays or mental wellness Mondays, right? Whatever kind of phrase or event you want to create is happening. Checking in and being more intentional. Hey. You know, usually I see you on our walk and you haven't gone on a walk with us for a while. Or, hey, the weather's been a little bit gray and it's meh and it's really hot. Let's figure out a new creative way of how we can, can stay connected and work through, you know, supporting each other in these unique, unique spaces and situations. And thank you. And there have been um, enough village members who have spoken up, like I mentioned at the beginning of the introduction. Thank you for your putting this out there as a topic that you want to hear about, 
um, and we're delighted to help you know answer the questions any way we can. Our next question is, Dr. Brown, could you share tips to give someone who has been diagnosed with depression and is not yet ready to seek professional help, but is expressing that he, she wants to get better? So part of that, that tip would be meeting them where they're at. How do we, how do we plan to get better? That's what you, using their own words. How do you want to get better? What's your plan of getting better? What does better look like for you? Right. And so those are asking those questions that are focused on letting them drive and steer what works best for them. And from there, you could say, okay, it may, and treatment may not be medication, right? We don't always need to go directly to medication. It might just be, hey, let's, let's try and get you back to getting involved in the activities that you want to. And if you can't do that, then, okay, let's talk about possibly a therapist, right? And then working through those different levels of care. I'd like to expand that as we're waiting for more questions to ask, you know, someone now take, is ready to take that next step and they um, have found a provider. What can they expect in that first initial um, appointment and then, you know, maybe some treatment plans to just kind of take a little bit of the fear and unknown out of this equation? Great, great question. Great follow up. So what to typically expect, again, every provider um, has their own approach to intake, but um, it also depends on if you're going into a private practice or in a hospital, right? But at the end of the day, intake is essentially the first time we're meeting, first couple times we're meeting, we're collecting information. And so you as a patient, um, these are what I've told a lot of my patients and people I've been working with are helping them work through that that moment of like uncertainty is bring your bring your resources, bring your, bring your medical records. I, you don't have to bring everything. Right, but as much as you can, what current medications are you on? What, you know, if you've had any surgeries, right? All, and this goes well with seeing a therapist or a psychiatrist or you know, whatever provider you're, you're seeing, um, bringing that to the table so that way they are able to assess, you know, we're ruling out the medical stuff. And now we're seeing that, yes, this is a behavioral health department. Or, hey, you know, I noticed my symptoms started March 15th, the day after this, or I noticed, right, bringing that, that, that data, that information can help with us understanding as providers what works best or how to start with developing that training. Um, and also have a goal in mind. What do you want to get out of this treatment? Do you want to learn coping skills? Do you want to feel motivated to go outside and be in the garden or take walks with your friends or you know attend a community meeting, right? Come in with that those ideas of what you want out of treatment, so that way you and that provider can develop that collaborative plan together. Of is that realistic? What can we do with it? And how close you can't get to that? How close can we get to that? Um, and I think that's where to start. Awesome. And now, can you take notes or bring a care partner with you? Is what's appropriate for your behavioral health appointments? I think all of that comes down to your 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 openness and what you want to do, and explaining that to the provider who you're meeting, and saying, "Hey, you know, this is another person I think is a great support to me." Now, that person may not be at every session, or it could be the one that helps you know transport you there. But part of that, unless it's your significant other and you're going there for you know couples or family sessions. Um, having that partnered with you, taking notes. I, I always recommend um, my patients and others I work with to take notes, write down questions before and after sessions. Um, I sometimes give homework. And so I ask you to bring that back. What was your experience? You know, what did you learn? What did you not like, et cetera. So that way that helps you um, really be engaged with treatment. And you can also you have your own diary or journal of what you've been doing in your work and seeing what where you're at. Um, I see a question that came in, where can I find resources for group behavioral health therapy? Um, hard question to answer because this the District of Columbia, Virginia, Maryland, it can kind of be anywhere. <laughs> um, but a good place to start, I would say, is um, a good amount of hospitals have outpatient programs, a lot of um, practices that uh, have behavioral health components, you could just start with maybe even calling um, 211 um, is another great easy community resource referral when I'm just calling them and saying behavioral health or group therapy, group sessions, um, and seeing where they can, where they can direct you. 
Um, and then also, if you're already working with a therapist or you want to start with a therapist with individual, they will also be able to connect you to some possible groups that are happening um, free and or through insurance. It just depends on the setup of each, each entity. Expanding on that question, Dr. Brown, when like would one say a one-on-one -on -one with a provider versus a group? When How do you distinguish which one is the most appropriate? Yeah, I think it depends on just the overall presentation and the, the scope of the group, right? Um, without going into a lot of details of acronyms, right? Like a, a traditional coping, let's, let's use a, a, a grief group, right? Um, you're in the cycle of grief and you just don't want to talk about it all. You don't want to be around anybody. That might be a place where you start with individual and then work into possibly going to a free Grief group or an AA and the NA group, right? That's uh, alcohol anonymous and narcotics anonymous. You're used actively using, or you've been sober for four years, and you have recently been urged or having feelings that you want to use. AA and NA might be completely appropriate, but you let's flip the coin and say you started using and you're trying to get back sober and you need some accountability, you need some direction. You could be at that stage where you do NAAA and a therapist, right? Um, but I think then going to a higher level of group therapy, like high level processing groups that are based in navigating complex emotions, like a DBT group, dialectical behavioral therapy group. Um, if you've been through the modality before, it makes sense to just go into a group therapy session. But if you have not, then you would, they will require you to go through individual therapy and then add on the group therapy. So it depends on how severe your symptomology is and how you'd be able to navigate that in a group setting. Would you be able to regulate yourself or would that be too triggering or too overwhelming? And so mm -hmm. if it would be having that individual space first to develop skills, get some grounding and then work into groups. And can your primary doctor refer you to someone? Is that a good place to start? You can. A lot of primary doctors, either, you know, if they're really immersed in working with the population, they may have a wealth of resources and others may not. Um, a good resource for a lot of individuals, if you have insurance, is start with your insurance and ask for behavioral health resources in your area that are in network. Um, or asking, you know, can I be assigned a case manager, behavioral health case manager, a lot of insurances now offer that as, a, as an option um, where you could even have a telehealth therapist that you take over the phone and you work through and find the resources, whether it's a tele uh, practitioner or a case manager, et cetera, they can help find the resources and connect you. Um, another resource, again, depending on the Maryland or DC area, um, 211 is always a great resource. You can always just check in with the Department of Behavioral Health um, any local hospitals typically have a good amount of resources. Um, there's also, and I'll drop some of these in the chat, there's other um, like telehealth platforms like Psychology Today, Zocda, Alma Health, and those are some um, different platforms that you can explore and find providers um, for various needs. And you usually just put in your demographic information, whatever insurance, or if you're doing out of pocket, and go for it. Excellent. Thank you. Any, oh, another question. Can you talk about Medicare coverage for different types of therapies? Are there limits, for example, number of sessions? Is therapy mostly covered? Therapy is mostly covered. The only component with Medicare is that, and this is recent, this is a recent change, so it opens up more resources. Originally, only doctors and social workers were able to be paneled with Medicare. Um, a law passed just last year, so making it effective this year, if I'm not mistaken, maybe end of last year, that licensed professional counselors um, and master's level psychologists can now be paneled with Medicare. And so that opens the door for allowing more providers to be paneled. And what paneling means is that they're in contract with those providers so they can provide that service to you and be reimbursed. Um, 
there's typically not a, a limit on sessions, but if you wanted to go to therapy like every day, um, that might be a, a little bit of a difficult, but typically, you know, weekly to bi-weekly therapy sessions are right within most, and even with Medicaid and Medicare, it's usually right in that, that coverage area, and it's usually not a concern. Um, they usually, and I think they even change it now, where as long as it's not two types of therapy happening on the same day, you're fine. So you could see, and even in my practice, I've seen a, a, a person that I am, their CBT clinician, they have another program where they do a day program. And so long as there are different types of treatment modalities happening and not at the same overlap, there's no issue. But part of that is, again, working with that behavioral health um, case manager or receptionist that you're speaking with your insurance can help. Thank you. Now, we've been talking a lot about what we can and should do. What about the things if you um, think you might have depression or anxiety, should you avoid absolutely? And avoid impulsive behavior, um, and avoid um, engaging in excessive drinking or substance use. Um, and especially from a depression standpoint, you know, if you're feeling like you're going to harm yourself or you don't feel like you could be safe, contacting, you know, the local authorities or going to the hospital um, to get help and support. Um, if you have a history of suicide attempts in the past and you notice symptoms are starting to rev back up, it's a good proactive approach is to go in and get help. I say the thing that you should not do is just sit and suffer. That's the biggest piece, right? Don't suffer in silence. Um, let your 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 village, your community network know what's going on. Let your providers know um, and get help. Don't, don't suffer. And can you repeat that number? Was it nine eight eight? If the, it is now, what's the difference between nine eight eight and two one one? So nine eight eight is mental health and crisis services. Um, and so they made it as close to 911 because it functions in that same modality of mental health and behavioral health crises, as well as not being medical crisis. So if you need, um, you know, you you injured yourself and you call 911. 988 is I'm not feeling safe. I don't feel well. I'm depressed. I'm anxious. You know, I'm having a panic attack. Or I just had a really bad panic attack. You know call 988, especially if you don't already have like a therapist or a provider that you can easily access. Um, or your, let's just say it's after hours, you know, your provider is gone for the weekend or whatever, um, 988. Um, another great resource that um, staff or um, what you all can do is create safety plans. If you know you have a history of depression or anxiety and you know that there's triggering events, if there's a um, death anniversary coming up, if there's, a, you know, these different things that in life cause you great distress and despair, having a plan in place and people to hold you accountable, what are some things that we can do proactively to help us get over that, over that difficult space um, and navigate? If someone needs help and does not speak English, where can you get help? 980, they have translation spaces. That's excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 980, still have, mm -hmm. email, or even web chat. Wow. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Um, now, asking about like seeing a provider, is in person better than telehealth? Or, um, you know, what do you recommend? I think it just depends on what you're willing to try. Um, and so, you know, it, and it just depends on how engaged you would be, right? It's harder to, for some people, right? If you know that you're someone that doesn't like to look at a screen or you have high distractibility and you know that being inside the house is just the space where you want to get out of and you know, you have a dog there or a significant other that, you know, you you need space and you don't have that. Evolve how you fit and navigate that, then in person is probably the best. If you have a space, an uh, uh, environment where you can disclose or you have limitations, it causes more stress and worry. It makes sense to try a telehealth 
provider and see what works. And having a conversation with whatever provider that you see is saying, what are some of the options of receiving treatment that, you know, should I, you know, not be able to make it in? Is there a way to do a phone? Or is there a way to do a video um, and vice versa? Excellent. Thank you all for your excellent questions. We have a little more time if you have any last lingering questions in this safe space for Dr. Brown. Um, and as a reminder, everyone will receive a recording of this today's presentation to re-review all of this wonderful knowledge at on your own time. Um, you'll have a list of the resources mentioned and of course, a link to today's evaluation. We have another question just came in. Given the shortage of therapists, what is a realistic time frame? And I'm assuming this means for to get an appointment. Yeah, to get an appointment. Um, it depends, right? It can it can vary, and it also depends on what you're looking for, right? If you're looking for a very niche specialized treatment modality. Let's just say you want to work on trauma and EMDR is the provider. You want an EMD provide, EMDR provider. That might take a little bit of time. And so what can you do in the in the inner what in ways that you can get that support? And some of that could be talking with your provider and saying, hey, I'm planning to get on with wait list to put support therapist. But in the meantime, you know, is there a, some of the resources or medication you would like to trial with me? Um, or is that attending some some support some support and emotional well-being groups and kind of help you tie over until you get that intake? Um, using like ZocDoc and Psychology Day, all those, a lot of those appointments you can get within a couple of days. Um, and so a lot of times here, even in our department of psychiatry, when we're transitioning people out of our inpatient unit, you know, we our standard of care is that they're going, they're doing, they're doing a warm handoff to another provider. So either they have an already established provider or they don't. And I would say probably 60% of the times they don't. And so with them being discharged, we're connecting them to a provider with an appointment within two weeks. And so there's there's more, more access. It just may not be the traditional in-person access that you would expect. And so it might be virtual but at least it's someone laying eyes on you and providing some type of support until you can get that level of care that you want. And also remember, you are not locked into a therapist, you're not locked into a psychiatrist, you're not locked into a specialist or a, a primary care physician, right? If something goes off and you want to try someone else, you have that free autonomy to say, you know, these are some areas, and this always try, start with trying to, you know, problem solve with that provider. But at the end of the day, if it doesn't work or you need more or a different level of intervention that they aren't able to do, um, ask them about a referral or a connection or a warm handoff to another provider that might be able to better address your needs. All right. Thank you, Dr. Brown. The, the, the gratitude is already coming in. Um, I'll direct everyone to the chat box, um, Little Falls. Um, as, a, as a local resource, if you're living in that area, started a mutual support group with a facilitator. Um, and that's a wonderful way to meet people and lead to social connection. And everybody loves to meet for lunch. Um, I have another question on, on the chat. How can you help someone overcome the stigma of seeking support? Yeah, seeking support, stigma. I think asking that question um, is the first step, right? It's it's yourself understanding that this, what am I, I'm a human, right? At the end of the day, we're human and we have a right to have emotional responses to what we've experienced. And even more so for older adults, right? You spanning, just think about decades of the things that have gone on and things you may have experienced in your life. It's, it's okay to figure out, I may need something that's beyond physical. And I think that's to start with a lot of stigmas, understanding that you're, it's okay. It doesn't mean you're broken. It doesn't mean you're unfixable. It, it doesn't mean you're weak. It means you're strong enough to say, hey, something else is wrong or something else is not right. And I'm doing what I can to figure out how to better myself. And use those words, Kate, that you said of thriving while aging. Right? It's going back to how can I 
to get back to that space of pride or that, that space of happiness. And I use that example of gardening because it's just, the weather is awesome, right? But it's the idea of how can I get back to doing those things that I really enjoy that really bring me happiness and peace and, and, and overall well-being. And that's finding that balance of, it may be physical, it may be mental, it might be both, but how do we go about finding those spaces and, and demystifying stigma? Like there's even stigma with over adults and some physical health, right? And medication and right. And so it's understanding the importance of how can I continue to thrive in this, this age and stage of my life that might require some professional support. What a wonderful session today. Thank you, Dr. Brown. This is, you You all have really put yourselves out there with sharing some, some things in this safe space and we've learned a lot. Um, and if there are no other questions today, we'll, we'll say one last thank you to um, Little Falls for introducing us, um, Greater Stonegate and Friendship Heights Neighbors Network. Um, and of course, Dr. Brown from Sibley Memorial Hospital. Everyone. Thank you and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.